Here on KGRA Radio, welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. For most of the people in the world, when they think of UFO crash retrievals, they think of Roswell in 1947. And it's true that the Roswell case became the go-to UFO crash retrieval for a good reason, and that's there are quite a few witnesses who, even 30 years or more after the fact, were willing to talk to investigators and provide a remarkable amount of detail to bring that event back to life. But Roswell does not appear to be the only case of UFO crash retrieval. Far from it. Uh, as an aside, it's definitely worth asking what might be the reason for multiple retrievals of what we would think are highly advanced aerial or spacecraft. But I'd like to remind myself that we've lost a few space shuttles over the years, and those are certainly advanced. And we have all kinds of mishaps in our modern world. Maybe it's not so outrageous that even more advanced societies would have problems here on Earth. But I digress. Before anyone talked about Roswell, people were talking more than 70 years ago about another UFO crash, one in Aztec, New Mexico, on March 25, 1948. The case was discussed in a book published in 1950. And before long, it was subject to a journalistic attack that completely discredited it at least as far as the public was concerned, and also UFO researchers. For years and years afterward, the Aztec case was regarded as a hoax by UFO researchers. A few brave souls over the years continued to look into the case, but no one was really able to publish a strong enough case to change many minds. That is, until Scott and Suzanne Ramsey came along. As you will see, after you hear what they have to say about this case, not only will you have a very difficult time dismissing this event as a hoax, but you're likely going to come away with the opinion that this is perhaps the best UFO case, or at least one of the very best UFO cases, at least in terms of witness testimony and corroboration. Uh, the Ramseys have devoted their lives to this case with some important help, it should be pointed out, from researchers Dr. Frank Thayer and Frank Warren. The Aztec story is remarkable mainly due to what actually happened so many years ago, but also due to the incredible effort of the Ramses to rehabilitate this story and bring it back into our history where it deserves to be. So, without any more waiting, let's jump in. Scott and Suzanne Ramsey, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, well, thanks, thanks for having Tracy. <laughs> yeah, Tr Tracy actually is sitting here in the room silently but she's she's got her pen and paper and uh, keyboard ready as well okay so but we're really happy to have you here listeners should know that we the three of us met in 2003 at the aztec ufo symposium and right. it was my pleasure to meet the two of you at that time and scott you were already deep deep into the aztec investigation and suzanne you have worked with scott every inch of the way now uh, the two of you, just for listeners to know, you've spent several decades now, a lot of your own money, um, is it half half a million dollars that you've spent in the investigation of this? Way over that now. Way over. Uh, gone through 55,000 or 50 plus thousand documents? Yes, more than yeah. that now. Well, we've not only gone through them, but we actually have them Yeah. related to this incident. Before we jump in, I just want listeners to appreciate, just visualize, if you will, the crash of a UFO that was denied, debunked for generations, and you go into the case and you dig out, uh, find, I guess we should say, uh, original witnesses to the event that no one had talked to before. You uh, avoid all attempts at at um, exaggeration, at sensationalizing. You you spend your entire career and life sticking to the facts and digging into a deep investigation. And what you end up doing is you re rehabilitate what is undoubtedly one of the most important UFO crash retrievals of all history. And that's exactly what the Ramses have done. Like, you guys did it. Congratulations. And I would just like to ask uh, either of you, if you want to jump in and, and describe to listeners what actually happened at Aztec, New Mexico on March 25th, 1948. 
Well, it actually started a few days, uh, a few weeks before that. Um, in the state of New Mexico, towards the center, there is a town called Cuba, New Mexico. And of course, many of us have heard of Los Alamos, which is up in the mountains. And then Farmington and Aztec are up in the northwest corner along the Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah border. And um, for a few weeks before the actual incident, there had been sightings at Los Alamos and in the Cuba, New Mexico area. And um, there were reports, the police officers had a stack of reports that they had made as well as military on sightings that they had had. <clears throat> so we get to the day before, well, actually they, they bring in um, uh, Lincoln La Paz. Dr. Lincoln La Paz to try and answer what has happened here, what's going on. And La Paz stays for a little bit and he goes out into the desert and observes and he comes in and says that they're meteorites. And it enraged the people of that area so much, it was insulting to them because meteorites don't aren't different colors, they don't turn sharp corners, they don't accelerate, and they had seen structured craft. With portholes. With portholes. And obviously that's not what, what they were seeing was not um, meteorites. So there it was a day before, and there were two police officers that would meet for pie. They had they covered different territories in New Mexico, highways and, and roads, and um, they stopped to have pie at a little cafe in Cuba. And they would always have pie and coffee, pie and coffee, whenever they would get together. This particular evening, one of the officers is talking about his frustration of not being able to help the people, how insulting La Paz was. And he says, if I see it again, see one again, I'm going to follow it. Well, it just so happens after they separate later on that evening, the officer sees a structured craft, but it was different this time because it was fluttering like a leaf. And he proceeds to follow it. And he goes through the night and it's, Quite a journey to get up to New Mexico, and it was even more of a journey. I mean, up to Aztec, and it's even more of a journey now, or then after the uh, before the the highways had been put in. So was Jesse as, New Mexico police officer Manuel Sandoval. I'm going that's through right. the book. That's right. Uh -huh. And I, I want you to keep going here, but it's important that that listeners realize you guys didn't just pull up generic witnesses. You got their names, you know, about their career, their lives. And, and uh, so there's actually a lot of specific information that you've you've uh, gotten in terms of your research and in supporting the story. Right. But please, Suzanne, continue. I'll just add this, that if we're not able to qualify it um, and document it, then it doesn't go in the book. We can have all the information we want, but if we can't prove it, it does not go in the book. And so that's mm -hmm. that's where we sit with that. So it, morning, it starts to get towards morning, early morning, and we're now approaching um, Blanco, New Mexico. And the craft is continuing, and so is uh, Officer Sandoval. As they get to Blanco, Officer Sandoval loses the craft visually for a little bit. And the terrain, Rich, you've been there. Tracy, I'm not sure if you have, but there's, oh my gosh, cliffs and bluffs and sandstone. And, and it's really a lovely area, but it's very, very diverse in terrain. And so he loses sight. And about that time, there is a gentleman, um, Mr. Archuleta, Valentine Archuleta, Archuleta, that goes out to his goat pen after breakfast it's about five in the morning and goes to let his goats out and he hears a very loud like sonic boom and he looks up and here is this craft now he is a survivor of the baton death march so he's seen a lot in his life already <laughs> and there was an incredible uh, fact that you added into his bio when i was reading the book 
for those who are not familiar with this, the Bataan Death March during the Second World War was a epic, monumental, and horrific uh, example of the treatment of U.S. POWs by the Japanese during that war. And these men, uh, about half, I think New Mexico had um, yeah. almost 2,000 volunteers yes. uh, in the National Guard, and uh, about half of them died yeah, during that. Uh, right. They were beaten. They walked for back and forth and back and forth and miles. They were starved. It was it was a terrible ordeal. And he was had recovered, but um, you can imagine. He was a pretty rugged guy and had seen a few things in his life. So he saw this, and he followed it on his property visually and it as it's fluttering hits a, a cliff and the cliffs what would you say 200 foot up? It's, it's over 300 300 foot above the ranch and um it hits a, a cliff and scrapes it and sparks fly and it continues on well he loses sight of it and decides he's going to walk down to the nearest telephone, which is about a mile away down at the general store. So we follow the craft, and it ends up going due north, absolute due north. And mm -hmm. we now have, <clears throat> have several oil field workers that are on their way to an oil field site, and they are called... To, to change their plans and their schedule and move to a new location. And they said, there's a fire out on uh, Hart Canyon Road. You need to go out there first. So they head on out there. And as they approach the road and, and, and the bluffs, they see a group of, of gentlemen out there and other oil field workers. And they said, well, we came out to see about the fire. And they said, well, the fire came and went had nothing to do with this it's it's across the road but wait till you see what's on top of the bluff so they climb the mesa and they get to the top and here they see this craft and um, they proceed from there to crawl around on it now there are other witnesses there too ranchers a county commissioner a sheriff uh, a variety of people that are there and they proceed to the young men, oil field workers, climb around on it. They take a pole, they poke a hole in the only crack or hole on the entire craft. It's in fully intact except for this tiny, tiny hole that's about the size of a quarter. They jab their pole in there and it hits a lever and the a staircase comes comes down. Uh -huh. They they thought it. They, they were not thinking flying saucer. They were thinking this was some type of prototype aircraft. You know, as we all know, New Mexico is the breeding ground back then of uh, prototype. Still is today. They really thought this was a rescue mission to get American pilots out of whatever this craft was. They had no idea that they were looking at something that was potentially extraterrestrial. Right, exactly. And you, you mentioned in the uh, witnesses that you have interviewed that one of the unusual things, of course, was the fact that uh, sometime during that morning, people saw a helicopter. And that was about as unusual as the flying saucer. That's yeah. True. yeah, Doug Nolan said, I didn't know it was more amazing, this craft or the fact that we saw a helicopter came and spent a very short time at the, at the uh, site and then turn around, bank to the northeast like it was heading up to Colorado. Yeah, in 1948, helicopters were a very new kind of technology, of course. Yeah. And uh, so uh, presumably the Army had sent this over to investigate and find out what was going on in advance of sending uh, the rest of their uh, military detachment over to secure the, the site, I would imagine. Right. I would think, yeah. yeah. And, and we know now that the that one of the three radar bases north of uh, north and east and south of Los Alamos that was operational in '46. And you don't, you know, even with the old lash up radar, you don't need three to triangulate. All you need is one. And that, you know, we have all the records from that uh, radar base, the 767th. Yes. And it was up and running as early as '46. So it. If it picked it up on radar, then they pretty much had a good idea where it was. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And 
Um, I want to hear you describe the rest of this, but what's interesting is when you compare the Aztec event to, say, Roswell. I mean, everyone's heard of Roswell. But as, and I know you'll describe this in detail, but Aztec had so many on the scene witnesses compared with Roswell. Yes. With Roswell, you've got uh, the rancher, Mac Brazel, and he doesn't even see the craft itself. He just sees the debris right, uh, right. after it's come down. And, you know, he shows some of it to his neighbors, the proctors, and they call the sheriff's office. And you have a little bit of this commotion. But with the Aztec, it's a totally different situation over at Hard Canyon where, uh, as you'll describe, you've got the oil workers and you've got other people just in the area. You've Lots of witnesses. And you found many of them. Mm-hmm. And they, they all had their story to tell. And what struck me in going through the accounts is how corroborative they were of each other oh, after right, decades right. and decades and decades like that that's i mean yes it's a case of witness testimony and i'm sure skeptics will say well if i don't have a body if i don't have material it's not proof but right. you've got like what does one do with all of these witnesses who and some of these were deathbed confessions that that you guys got yeah. uh, who told detailed stories so Anyway, please just go on with this uh, and describe how this whole thing played out. You, you mentioned that there was a, a quarter-sized hole. It was the only bit of damage that anyone noticed to this fairly large craft. Right. Uh, and they pushed in something like a broom handle or some kind of something through and, and somehow activated that. But there's right. much more to this story if you can fill it in. Yeah, they... What they ended up doing, the hole was actually in a porthole, which was mirrored, like what we would use as mirrored sunglasses today, or described as, and uh, once they realized that was a porthole and found the hole, they were using a fire pole. Back in 48, as it is today, a lot of those oil field trucks have their own firefighting equipment on them because of gas and oil, you can imagine. They never know what they're going to run into. Yeah. And so it was actually a fire pole they stuck in there and was wiggling around trying to do something to get these guys out, you know, to help these alleged American test pilots, I, I was, was going through their mind. Okay. Uh, once the door came down, they were able to go in and look up through the, the staircase and see two people slumped over at a control panel. And then on another deck, about 14 other bodies. So you had two on the top and 14 down on the, for the lack of a better word, the second second floor. And uh, it was about that point, late in the morning, that the military showed up. And the military... May I just jump in and ask a question? So there were earlier versions of what happened at the scene. And uh, I think this might have been maybe from Steinman's work, Bill Steinman, who uh, incidentally, unfortunately, passed away a year ago. He was one yeah. of the very key investigators of this back in the 80s. Uh, I'm not sure if it was him, but there were different accounts of the individuals who came in and, and peered through the wind, through the portal. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I mean, there was one version, at least that I recall, where it was – high-level MJ-12 type guys who were there and, and peered in. It, it seemed a bit improbable to me. Uh, uh, you know, the version of oil workers seems actually m- much more plausible. Right. But were they able to peer through the porthole before they opened the hatch? Were they able to see the bodies inside the craft before they were able to open it? Or is that unclear to you? Well, a little bit unclear, but going back to Doug Nolan, once they realized that the portholes were basically blending into the craft, and as he described it, the material that a mirrored sunglass would be made out of, I think that they could tell there was something. There were two beings of some type, not a, maybe a good view of them, and that's what made them kind of go into a frantic mode and poke around to see if they could activate something to open up the craft. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I just was curious about that. Sure. With so, our research, uh, what we've seen is that they actually 
scientists and things came in later, and we can go over that as we go along. But uh, okay. and so they already it, the craft had already been opened long before right. the scientists got there. Yeah. Scully's version, Frank Scully, who wrote the first book, Behind the Flying Saucers, his version was more when the scientists arrived at the scene. The people we interviewed, the only thing that arrived at the scene uh, was the military, and they were all separated from each other and interviewed by what they described as older men in the military. So these weren't young recruits. These were guys... And, you know, Doug said, hey, I was 19 at the time. These guys were older. I'm like, how old is older? Oh, they were in their 30s, early 30s to mid 30s. So that uh, that kind of cracked me up, a 19-year-old thinking 30 was old, but that's okay. <laughs> um, well, right. But one thing that was amazing was how consistent, like Doug Nolan, Ken Farley, people like that, that, you know, Ken Farley didn't even live in the area. He was coming down through Durango on his way to San Diego. And when we interviewed uh, Ken in Bat Cave, uh, Arizona, it was almost like Doug Nolan was sitting next to him. And they didn't know each other, but Doug Nolan talked about, I knew everybody, just about everybody at the crash site, except for two or three guys that stood at the western end. Uh-huh. And when we interviewed Ken, he said, well, we really didn't know anybody, so we kind of kept to ourselves. We, we went on the western edge of the, the crash site or the Mesa and just kind of stood trying to figure out what was going on. So there's so many intertwining things like that that, you know, make you kind of scratch your head. There were also, in during the interviews, there were a couple things that, statements that they made that we have kept to ourselves. Um, as kind of a gut check to see right. if they're accurate or if they've read this someplace. I mean, you have if you're going to go all the way, you might as well go all the way. And if they've read it someplace or they've heard it, that's a different story. And so there are a couple things that we've kind of held close to mm -hmm. our vest to assure that they were all telling their own story and that they were actually there. And um, that has that's really good. served us well. Yeah, the only one we've divulged uh, in this the second book uh, was the fact that I said to Ken, what what strange thing uh, did you notice about the craft? He said, well, the fact that it was like a lenticular disc laying on the, it was very thin cross section. And he talked about at the leading edge of the wing, for the lack of a better word, there were three bands of gold, like uh -huh. metal that metal that was machined in. And Doug told the exact story. He said, as we looked at it, if you looked real close, there were three bands of a gold-colored material, maybe brass, maybe bronze, but it stood out from the pewter shape or pewter color of the craft. And that was nowhere in writing. No one else had ever written that. That's never been uh, released anywhere. So we, we felt really comfortable in the fact that several people that didn't know each other and didn't speak to each other even there, came up with that same information. And never also, kept in so touch with all. each other. Right, no, exactly. Uh, there's also the, the case of the two police officers who mm -hmm. were on the scene, and, and I recall you saying, uh, Scott, I'm sure you as well, Suzanne, like when you first heard the first witness say, yeah, there were two cops on the scene, you're thinking, that's a little unusual. This is a very remote area, right. having police so quickly yeah. arrived but then you again you had a second witness uh absolutely corroborate that yeah and yeah. it's kind of funny manuel sandoval really was a part-time deputized uh, police officer for this the town of cuba he worked security on the pipeline during the day he never wore a uniform they didn't even have uniforms he wore a cowboy shirt blue jeans and his deputy badge either on his hat or on his belt. Okay. And when we interview these witnesses back when we first found them, they said, and one guy we finally figured out was law enforcement because he had his badge on his belt. He wasn't in uh -huh. uniform. That was him. And the other police officer at the scene was either the constable from Aztec or it was Andy Andrews Highway Patrol. 
not sure which. Andy Andrews is the one that would meet Manuel Sandoval for coffee and pie down in Cuba, and they would talk. So I don't know if Andy got reinvolved in the pursuit that night. Uh, some people told us that they thought it was a constable uh, in police uniform from downtown Aztec. But either way, there were two law enforcement people at the site. That's the thing about this. There's actually quite a bit of corroboration from the various witnesses that you all have spoken to. And I just think, uh, personally, uh, it's, I mean, we'll have to get into how this case was uh, trashed, smeared, debunked by J.P. Khan and how that affected it for generations. But sure. But I just want to say, like the the strength of these witnesses that you have both brought to to uh, light, I think, was enough to convince an entire generation of UFO researchers, including people like Stanton Friedman and many yes. others, who had who had long assumed that this was a hoax case, to reconsider it and to think, oh wow, this is actually not a hoax, and in fact, this is this is a really important case. Yes. And incidentally, I just want to add here, you mentioned earlier in this interview, Lincoln La Paz, who is, uh, I think his t actual title was maybe director of meteoritics at uh, University of New Mexico. Yes. yes. Uh, very, important, very important man in La Paz. Later in 1948, as some researchers probably know, became the lead scientific consultant to the infamous green fireball phenomenon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is actually one of the most important ufo developments of the late 1940s in my own opinion so all of this really seems to tie in together and i think it yeah. it has to tie into aztec but i'm getting a little ahead of myself here um for this for this segment i'm hoping we can go over more of the details of the of the crash the recovery uh, maybe the transportation of the disc, and then and then perhaps in the next segment we can go into um, how Frank Scully got this information, the whole Silas Newton, Leo Jabauer connection, J.P. Kahn, the and how that whole thing panned out. Okay, let's take a quick break. I'm Richard Dolan here with Scott and Suzanne Ramsey, authors of the Aztec Incident. We'll be right back. I'm back here with the Ramseys. We are talking about the Aztec UFO crash retrieval from 1948 can we continue if you guys are good yeah, absolutely with getting into the nature of the of this event and how it all played out i want to i want to add one thing in our numerous trips to new mexico uh we were overnight staying overnight in cuba to interview some of the old timers which were a vault of information and suzanne and i were coming out of the local grocery store in our rental and I looked out and not very high in the air, 1,000 feet, maybe 1,200 feet, we see this bright landing light, like a fighter plane. And I said to Suzanne, my God, look at that, how low that thing is. And just then it turned a fluorescent green, like a, it, the best way to describe it was a green jelly bean, flew right <laughs> over the town. It was so bright, it illuminated everything green and went right over Deer Lake and down toward Los Alamos. So green fireballs are still being seen in New Mexico. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Very amazing. interesting. Um, but get back to the crash. The um, I'll, I'll give my little piece here that I know Suzanne has some things she wants to add. Uh, it was late morning, maybe early afternoon, again, when the military showed up. They broke everybody separately and interviewed them very sternly, very strictly. But in, in a case of Ken Farley, who admitted later in his life, he was not being very cooperative and told him, I'm not in the military. You don't tell me what to do. They got very forceful with him and threatened them all. If you don't pay attention, listen to what we're, we're telling you, you could die. This is of national security, what you're seeing here. And Ken said immediately for his uh, kind of a smart aleck young kid he was, he said all of a sudden we got very, very serious because they weren't messing around. But when they said mm -hmm. that, he said they got our attention. Ken, um, Doug Nolan said the same thing, that they were all taken aside. 
and told that you have no idea how important this thing is and you are to keep your mouth shut and you will never, ever talk about this. Yeah, kind of like yeah. nothing happened, you didn't right. see anything, that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and Ken said it worked because, first of all, it was too bizarre. I, I, I couldn't tell many people, they wouldn't believe me. And secondly, I really didn't need the trouble. I, sure. I, I understand that. And, and he was a, all those oil field guys, and not the Ken was, he was traveling through, but they were tough guys. I mean, you had to be a pretty tough, scrappy guy to do that for a living. And Ken uh, Farley, he, even later in life, he was a big guy. Uh huh. And uh, they intimidated him into keeping his mouth shut. But the, the military shows up and mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're all dispersed by early afternoon. And so we don't know really what happened after that. Uh, we can speculate that then probably in interviewing a gentleman that worked at Wright Pat, uh, Suzanne and I have not put him in a book. We still are going through a lot of the details, but he, uh, he claimed it was after the, the site was secure, then the scientists were brought in and uh, and they worked on the whole recovery of taking it apart and moving it out of there. Well, in one of the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, maybe one of you can talk about Fred Reed because I've got um, in your book here, this is a man who actually was able to describe to you the roughly two weeks worth of cleanup. Right. I think it's him right here that was involved. He had information about this. He worked with the OSS yep. back in the early 40s, was working for the military. You said in 1999 when you, Scott, uh, spoke with him. Yes. And he had a lot to say about this. He, he did. He, some planks. he loved the area so much that when he, when he later retired in life, he moved to Aztec. And I thought that was pretty funny. And, and I forget where his roots were. I have his obit here somewhere. <clears throat> but he... Um, they worked on they 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 appeared at the site long after the craft was had been moved, and their job was to landscape and make it look pretty, and if they found cigarette butts or anything like that, to bury it 18 inches in the sand, minimum of 18 inches, because of what he told us, we rented metal detectors and we found uh, nail pouch, uh, the old aluminum foil. Uh, chewing tobacco pouch, we found uh, junk, a lot of junk, but it, right. it, it's a lot of junk for a site that doesn't see many people. Right, exactly. And can you talk about the concrete slab? Mm -hmm. This strikes me is, is quite important to the story. We were interviewing a gentleman who we refer to as George in the book. I, in the next book, we'll divulge his real name because unfortunately, I believe he just passed within the last couple of years. We found him in an, in an unusual way. We were at Maxwell Air Force Base going through old Air Force records, the home of the archives of the Air Force in Montgomery, Alabama. And we found correspondence back and forth from that time frame going down to Walker Airfield, which had formerly been the Roswell Army Airfield. And there was one name they didn't redact. And I thought, well, that's unusual. I mean, they go through, they were actually redacting them because I was the first person that had ever requested these re, uh, documents. Uh -huh. And as fast as they're declassifying and redacting, they missed the name. And I got home to North Carolina and I'm looking through it. And I thought, now, why, why in the world did they leave that name there? Well, I tried to find out who he was. I went back to Maxwell. I showed it to the one of the intelligence officers. And he said, well, probably just a clerical error. You know, appreciate you bringing it to our attention. <laughs> I said, how do I find out where he was from? And we went through that. I won't bore you with all the details. And then it turned out people are prone to go back to where they came from originally. And he had moved back after his years in the service, moved back to that small town up in northeastern United States. Mm -hmm. And I found him and he agreed to meet. I said, I have a bunch of declassified records from your old group. I'd like to come up and go through them. OK, and he reluctantly agreed. We met at a hotel and uh, 
I showed him all, and he was he was amazed. He said, "I cannot believe these documents have, are all been released." Mostly, they were correspondence with him to Ent Air Force Base, the forty six zero two. Uh, that, yeah, this that, of, uh, in Colorado, they yep. were very, very important in terms of UFO investigations during the 1950s, particularly, right? I'll have to send you their mission statement. It says, remember, all the good UFO reports, I'm, I'm doing this ad lib, all the good UFO reports come here, the bad ones go to Project Blue Book. Yep. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, he, re- and he read that and laughed. Yeah. He said, yeah, I, I kind of remember that. But... Um, he never was at the crash site. He worked purely on the paperwork from Walker Airfield, and his yeah. paperwork was mainly personnel records. He was keeping track of about 200 people. And when I said, what do you mean keeping track? And he said, well, let's say Joe Smith was working the recovery. I wouldn't have Joe Smith at XYZ, like LaMarch or March Air Force Base, I would have him at McDill, and about halfway through the week, I'd have him in the infirmary because he sprained his ankle playing volleyball. That way, if Joe Smith ever talks later in life about working on a UFO recovery, we can say you were, you were at McDill. Matter of fact, that week that you're claiming you were sitting in the infirmary with a twisted ankle or a broken whatever. There's a really key point here. And it just mm-hmm. shows how sophisticated, even in 1948, yep. Yep. that the military was at at really keeping this whole thing under wraps. And truly, this is a cover up. I mean, there's yep. no other word for this. Um, knowing how to hide the real whereabouts of these basically 200 people, right, who yep. were apparently involved in the Aztec recovery for about two weeks, as I recall in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Right. So what you're saying is this this man, George, who you were speaking to, was he was responsible for helping to hide where these people were and to giving them false locations so that they would not be credible if they were to become witnesses later on. It's well, really think important. It, yeah. Think about after Roswell. I I feel like they learned so much. Uh, they stuck their foot in their mouth more than once with in at Roswell. And I think you know, they, they learned a great deal in how to handle themselves and, and how to cover their tracks a little better by the time Aztec had come eight months later. Yeah. Great point, Suzanne. I mean, at Roswell, they issued a press release <laughs> and it made the newspaper worldwide and yep. the entire world was trying to call everyone in Roswell you know, that afternoon. So, yeah, big, big problem that they had to de- uh, defuse, which eventually they did. But it's obvious eight months later now in Aztec, not that far away, actually, no. right? No. They um, learned the lesson and handled this, you know, really superbly from yeah. their right. point of view. The other thing is describe? that right after, oh, please, the, on. sorry, right, right at that time, this the next day after the Aztec incident happened, there was. Policies and how do we want to describe that? Well, actually, starting with the evening of March 25th, 1948, <clears throat> we have thanks thanks to Bob Coford of California, who's done an amazing job. Very talented researcher. Uh, CIA records, um, Army CID. The by the evening of March 25th, 1948. There are already policies in place to change military rules of reporting, and that, thanks to Bob, uh, who's going to help us on our next book, will be in our next book. You can read all the letters back and forth from the wire service about effective immediately, this will be changed, that'll be changed, whole method of reporting, whole method of uh, procedures. It was. It happened that night, that quick. They were Wait, making you're changes. saying... Wow. So they implemented significant policy changes on secrecy and reporting protocols the night following the crash. The night of the the, the, The the, the crash. The first night. Yeah. Right. And these went throughout the night. These policies were being changed. It's incredible. Just absolutely takes it to another level. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than a coincidence. Before we go any further, can you guys describe... Uh, in a little more detail, what 
what the oil workers and maybe anyone else might have seen inside the craft. You've got there are a couple, two bodies slumped over in one area. There were uh, maybe up to 14 or so other bodies. But in the and I'm only thinking back because I had a long conversation with Michael Schratt when we described mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. Described the tech crash. And a lot of this is really, I think, almost entirely based on your work anyway. But apparently people saw what looked like alien writing. Yes. Um, can you describe some of the details of what these witnesses saw, uh, what they reported? i go with Doug Nolan first. He said it was more like hier- hieroglyphics. Uh, Ken sort of described it in that way, not letters that we'd be used to seeing, but more like characters. Um, ironically, now that you got to remember the time frame, I'm interviewing Doug Nolan. He's talking about flat screen TVs in, in reference to what the monitors that were on their console. We didn't okay. even have we didn't have flat screen computers at that at that time. No, right. We, we still had CDs. the old bulky. Yeah, CDs. He, he, said, he talked about CDs, uh, which were not even in existence, not even a glimmer. Um, oh, CDs as in compact discs. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was just okay. amazing to sit there and hear him describe, you know, with a 70-year-old memory of what uh, they were looking at. They the, also had, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. They were wearing a one-piece, almost like a flight suit, jumpsuit. And they weren't your conventional alien-looking bodies. Um, they were short, three and a half, four feet, consistent. Okay. But they were more ch- child-faced. Uh, D- Doug said at first they thought, my God, are these children on board? But they weren't your stereotypical large, almond-eyed, big-headed aliens that we see and hear about from time to time. Their bodies were charred um, due to right. the, the craft coming down. So they were charred on the outside and they had perfect teeth. Perfect yeah, they all, teeth. Their own, no. own, yeah, that, that sounds silly to say, but uh, their teeth were absolutely perfect. No cavities. They were almost like they were molded dentures. They were perfect in every way you could think. But so their their faces were human like, would you say? Or is that the impression you got? Or or it's somehow different from to quote, human? To quote him, childlike in appearance. Uh, Ken Farley was a little reluctant to get real close to the craft, but he said at a quick glance when he was walking by the craft that they were not your t- stereotypical alien face that we've come to see right. through Hollywood. Not but, they also, the, the uniforms did not have any insignia or any rank. In other words, someone uh, as the leader or as a, holding a, a higher rank, it, they were all the same. And there's a differentiation in the in different accounts, and you'll hear people say, different people quote, uh, 12 to 16 bodies. But when you really look into that more deeply, what it is, depending on how many they had brought out, so the maximum was 16. There were 16 bodies. But when you hear the lesser amounts and you say, well, somewhere in that number, it's just that not all of them had been brought out already, so they weren't able to see all Mm -hmm. of them. That makes a lot of sense. Can you describe, uh, we've got about five minutes before we got to wrap this segment up. Okay. And um, there's just actually there's so much more. We're going to have to continue, I think, in the next segment, don't you think? I mean, sure. we've got, you've got the uh, the minister uh, yes. who was a witness and you've got there's a few few other witnesses I think we haven't covered. And then there's the entire, uh, you know, getting this thing out of Hard Canyon to wherever it was going. Apparently, Los Alamos is that the best mm-hmm. initial guess. Yeah, uh, I would love to get into that if we've got time. Sure. May I ask for this for this segment before we go any further? Is there any anything else that you'd like to say or summarize about this case? Because we are we're getting close to right. the end. I, I'd like to be able to tie this up in a nice way before we continue onward. I, I, go ahead. There's something that I think was interesting. Uh, 
about the location itself. During the time that we've been there, we've combed it and photographed it, looked at it. Scott slept there how many times at the crash site from every angle you could imagine. But it wasn't until we had a friend of ours come out and go up in a plane and actually photograph it from the air that you can actually see where plants, you know, in, in nature, plants grow randomly. They're not in a straight line. We see in landscaping, we create straight lines. That's, that's not how nature is. You could actually see pinion trees planted in straight lines. And you could see where they actually tried to uh, make this look like nothing ever happened there before. Oh, that's fascinating. It was, we, you should have just seen us the night, Rich, when, when those pictures came back and we all sat there quiet and it was, we just couldn't believe it. It was just really a, a very eye opening. But then it, it goes back to uh, Reed that uh, he talked about a lot of the trees have been plowed over and he, he figured it was a, a prototype bomber or fighter plane that crashed up there. And he talked about we were up there to re-landscape the entire mesa, get rid of the bulldozer tracks, get rid of all the scrapes, get rid of the dead trees, which they did a lousy job. We've preserved a lot of the dead trees that were uh, involved in 48. Uh, they're all, you know, bleached out like driftwood. And keep in mind, you're in the desert, so it's not like they rot. Yeah, they're not going to rot. But uh, getting back to what Suzanne said, the cover of our first book is the pictures that we're talking about. They flew over. If you look at that one very carefully, to the northeast of where the craft is laying is where all those trees are perfectly planted. We took hundreds of pictures that day that uh, Bill went up in the airplane. And when we got back to the hotel and we were going through the pictures, it hit us all at once. We go, my God, those trees are all planted in a pattern. That led us to look at other mesas and photograph. And like Suzanne says, nature doesn't do it that nicely. Right, so exactly. It, it was, um, but George, you were asking about the concrete slab. I never really answered right. that. He told us, if you think you're at the right site, we had to pour concrete footers to get the trucks, the flatbeds in there. And we had, we had to cut a road through a very silty soil and we couldn't put the stabilizers down. So we were de delayed a few days while we poured concrete slabs. And we've only found one. Um, there has to be two. Or exactly. And, or, or, or if somebody's already taken one. Um, but when George told me that, I got to give Randy Barnes credit. I called Randy Barnes in Farmington, who's a avid Aztec researcher. And he went out with a piece of rebar and kept sticking it through the silt until he went thud, thud, thud. And then spent the afternoon taking about a foot and a half of dirt off of that. It had just been washed over after all those years with silt. And speaking uh, of rebar, you that concrete slab had rebar in it, didn't it? Am I yes, getting that? It has two sizes of rebar and one size of pencil rod. It was very, very well reinforced to handle a lot of weight. Yeah, and like, what is this doing out in this region, right? That's well, the whole we question. Have not, we have not been able to find anybody, and having lived in that area, know a lot of people that could come up with a reason for that to be there. The oil field roads are all accurately mapped or marked as you can imagine they've got to have parts brought out to them it's a, a huge maze of roads the military road that they put in and the area where the um, slab is are not there's no reason for them if you look on the cover of our first book you'll see up again in the northeast corner you'll see where the road was cut, it was actually cut like a big cul-de-sac so the trucks could come in and continue going out. Keep in mind, those, those dragon wagons were all-wheel drive. All, all, every wheel on the truck was driven by chain. Um, over the years, that cul-de-sac now has eroded quite a bit. We, we refer to that road as the military road. It was funny, when we decided to take a core sample, Carl Flock was saying, you're wasting your time, Carl Flock being a big debunker of Aztec. 
Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a well cap. It's an oil well cap. Well, we have a lot of oil field experts in our circle of friends, including my brother-in-law, Suzanne's brother, Russ. He's been an oil field uh, manager for most of all his life. And uh, if that was an oil oil cap, we would have blown ourselves to kingdom come drilling a hole in it. But ironically, Carl wouldn't show up that day. We decided to drill a hole in it, take a course. In it. <laughs> it, it, Carl only lived two hours away. We flew from North Carolina out there to do it, but Carl decided to stay home that day. That's our guy, Carl. That was Carl. God, just say, I, I met Carl Flock as well, and yep. uh, longtime debunker, former CIA. Yep. yep. Uh, NICAP infiltrator back in the 60s, in my opinion. <laughs> And really, they never. And he also, you know, did debunking work on Roswell as well. It wasn't oh, just yeah, us. Yeah. It was de- yep. trying to debunk everything. And uh, honestly, did very poor work. He was a very smart guy, but did very poor work in the UFO field, in my opinion. And I yeah. always felt he was there solely to just spread uh, debunking disinformation on these key cases. I agree, a thousand percent. Yeah. Personal opinion. Yeah. He. Uh, Oh. <laughs> we'll, spend t- we'll spend time on him later, but he, he did a f- couple of funny things. I, Suzanne, I've never shared with the public. We'll share them with you. And that's uh, sort of the whole condensed uh, day of the crash site, uh, the first day at Aztec. Let's wrap up this segment here. I'm actually looking through your materials for like, a, oh, here we go. At the, the Aztec incident dot com. This is your website. And I've actually been hunting for the last few minutes and hadn't found it. Oh, so, we actually we actually pulled that down just recently. We pulled it down. No, no wonder I didn't find it. But you can keep <laughs> looking. It could be like a looking for a UFO. <laughs> but you can go to Facebook well, or Twitter. It is on Amazon, is it not? Or my uh, the book's out of print. We officially ended the printing on it uh, because we're moving on to a third book. Yeah. But th- there are used copies available. We have a limited edition of approximately 30 books that we'll be offering on Amazon. They're signed by Dr. Thayer, Suzanne, and myself, and we'll be offering those uh, for sale here in the future. You realize you're killing everyone who's listening to this because they're like, I want this book. (laughs) So we're waiting for volume uh, for a third edition. It'll and be bigger and better. Believe it'll me. be good to tell your listening audience things that we've talked about privately that Bill Steinman had agreed to join Dr. Thayer and Suzanne and I on a book, on our third book, and add some information that he found after his book came out. And it was <laughs> um, very exciting. And unfortunately, he dropped out of a heart attack. But... Uh, the new book will yes. contain his information. Do you want to stop well, and take a break now? Sure. Scott and Suzanne, thanks so much for this segment of the program. We're going to continue just as soon as possible with a little more follow-up because there's so much more to tell about the Aztec case. But for now, let's just wrap it up. That's all we've got for this program, but the Ramses and I aren't done. We'll be continuing into a few more of the details and complexities of the Aztec UFO crash retrieval as well as fascinating background on how this story surfaced and the truly nefarious manner in which it was smeared in the public mind. A truly effective hatchet job. But that'll be when we continue with part two of this series. For now, thanks for being here with me. And remember, while we learn and grow and search for the truth, let's be good to each other. Later.